So this week we um, started a new series called Contradictions in the Bible. And I actually had to re-record it um, because uh, it, it the, long story short, I have this laptop that's, I mean, super old and dying. It's, it's on life support. And it cut off the whole first part of the, of the lesson, the recording. And I don't have the software or the know-how to, you know, just run the new intro and insert it in. So I'm going to try and say most of the same things I said on Tuesday uh, at the lesson. And also I'm going to try and include uh, some of the comments that were thrown in. So let's, let's see where we get to. Um, first off, the reason why I'm giving, why we're doing this series is to hopefully deepen your faith and maybe to help you grow and, and to find, help you find answers. But there's this kind of Lee Strobel effect, like, right? Like, Lee Strobel is this guy that writes these books like um, um, The Case for Christ and different books like that. And, and they're good books. I, I don't have a problem with them. But the problem is, is that Christians do this thing where they study so that they can argue. So they'll go and they'll read a Lee Strobel book and they'll say, wow, that's great. Or it doesn't have to be just Lee Strobel. It can be anybody, really. So they read this this apologetics book and they say, wow, you know, I never thought of it like that. This has all the answers. So then they go out looking for arguments and, uh, you know, they, they do the whole YouTube comment thing where, you know, oh, look, here's this poor, stupid atheist. Let me go enlighten him. And, and that's definitely not what we're working towards. Um, I think that apologetics and theology are good to the extent that you learn something. But if it's just an excuse for you to become argumentative and go looking for fights, that's definitely not what the gospel is about. In fact, many times Paul tells us about, you know, being wise and, and, and maybe being quiet and trying to be at peace with people and that kind of stuff. And, and yes, Paul did, um, Paul did definitely um, discuss the gospel. You could even say argue the gospel. Um, with some people, but the point being that this wasn't something that he just went out and enjoyed the argument for the sake of the argument. He tried to persuade them to the truth. If it didn't work, well, he moved on. And he was not an argumentative person that was just going around looking for fights, and there's a total difference there. Um, and I also want to encourage you, don't assume that your perfection or having all the answers or anything like that will force someone else into doing the right thing. Okay, if, if, you're, if you're good enough, somebody else will still have to decide how to live their life. If you have all the right answers, if you perfectly answer every single uh, rebuttal and somebody can come up with, it's still their choice whether to um, listen or not listen. It, you, you can't take somebody else's choice away just because you had a well-articulated argument. Um, we're also going to look at not just, we're going to go through the Gospels and we're going to look at not just um, when it looks like the Gospels maybe contradict um, among themselves, so like let's say Matthew versus Luke, for instance, but also some things that Jesus said, maybe not a complete exhaustive list, but we're going to try to hit most of the main things um, uh, of things that Jesus taught that seem to contradict himself. So like for instance, when Jesus said, no one is good except for God. But then later, in a different part, he says, a good man produces good fruit. Well, how can how can a good man produce good fruit if there is no one good except for God? So these are just some of the examples of stuff that we're going to be looking at. Um, in tonight's uh, deal, though, we aren't really going to, or lesson, I should say, uh, we aren't really going to look too much at um, the Gospels themselves. We're just going to talk about the idea of contradictions. So uh, just a, a, little, a little brief introduction to, to, how, uh, to contradictions. Um, the Gospels have much more in common among themselves than they do um, at odds with the, with itself. You know, it's the same basic story, and you know the the people are the same. The 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 main gist of events is the same. I mean, there's there's so many things that are the same that I feel like sometimes people um, kind of blow the blow the differences way out of the water and like, oh, there's ah, ah. it doesn't have to be like that. Okay. We're talking about the same people, the same places. Um, there, there's much more in common. Now, you would think that two people saying the exact same thing the exact same way makes it more certain, but that's not really how the real world works. That's not really how people talk. When you have two people that give slightly different details about the same event, that makes it more believable that it actually happened, not, not less believable. Um, obviously, if there's contradictions in the story, that's one thing, okay? So 
Um, there was a man named Jesus, says person A, and then person B says there was nobody. There was never a person named Jesus. Well, those th those are contradictions. So that wouldn't really make this story believable <laughs> because it's a contradiction. But when you have just very um, little differences, like not exact word for word verbatim, and you're going to say, so hold on, you're going to say contradiction or no? Well, let me explain what a contradiction is. Because there seems to be a lot of confusion where, oh, that's a contradiction, that's a contradiction. Well, no, not, not really. A contradiction is something that is, it's a claim that is mutually exclusive. Okay. So for instance, in the end of the Gospels, does the Gospel say that one person and only one person went to the tomb and that there was only one angel and only one angel. There never was another angel at any other point in that day. And uh, that the the story of the gospel died there. See what I mean? Um, and it, well, the answer obviously being no. Um, the gospels don't make these... The, the things that people typically say are, are contradictions in the gospels are not mutually exclusive statements. Sometimes you'll, you, people might misunderstand that, they're, that it's a mutually exclusive statement, but when you understand that the Gospels are not trying to list every single detail, but only the details that are relevant to the part of the story that they're saying, well, that's a little bit different. Now, see, to us, that might sound, well, hold on, that's not very historical. Well, maybe by today's standards, we try to include every single detail that's humanly possible, but most books don't even do that. Uh, I just read a, a book um, on World War One. And it had nothing in it about the role of animals in World War One, except to say that horses were used a lot and a lot of horses were killed. That's it. I mean, it didn't it didn't really say much about anything. Does that mean that that history of World War One is wrong? Well, no. Of course, it doesn't mean that. Well, it contradicted history the history books. Well, no. It just didn't really talk about it because it really didn't have anything to say. You can have a history of World War One that. In, that doesn't include any of the details of women, okay? So that's like 50% of the population. Just completely remove them from, from the equation, and you can still have an accurate representation of World War One. So, see what I mean? Just because something's left out doesn't mean that it's a contradiction. So sometimes we read something and we say, okay, that is a mutually exclusive statement. There was only one angel at the tomb, but it doesn't say there was only one. It, says, it just says that there was an angel there. It doesn't say one angel and only one angel, and in no case, in no point in time on that, in that day were there ever more than one angel. It doesn't say that. So, um, so if you, some events. I'm sorry about that. My phone is is tripping out here. Um, so some events are presumed to be mutually uh, exclusive, such as the ending of the gospel, but they really aren't mutually exclusive. And so a contradiction has to be something two statements that cannot coexist. Uh, for instance, if I say Jesus was the Christ, and I also say Jesus was not the Christ, those are those are those are mutual, mutually exclusive. They're they're, they're they can't both be true. <clears throat> so now that we actually know what what a contradiction is, let's uh, let's go a little bit further now. Um, the starting point when you're studying something is always to give it a chance and take it for what it claims. You don't just go up to a book and say, I'm deciding that everything in this is not true. And furthermore, I'm going to also decide that it, although it was written as a history book, I'm going to take it as a book of poetry. That sounds, that sounds legit. Y you don't do that. The starting point for studying has to be you come to it to learn, you, you come to it to give it, you're giving it a chance, you're not just jumping to conclusions, you're taking it for what it claims to be, and uh, the Gospels are, are books that claim to be telling a true story. So we shouldn't just hop first off with, oh, it's filled with contradictions. We should ask the question, is it filled with contradictions, rather than just already believing it to be guilty. It's like when you go to court, right? And it doesn't matter what the situation is, whoever is in that room is guilty. I mean, we're talking about uh, the defendant and the prosecution. I mean, everybody's guilty. I mean, it's just they're all they're all guilty. Well, it's like, well, hold on now. You know, you, you got to give it a chance. <laughs> you, you you can't just assume guilt on everything. Now, obviously, there's there's a there's a rule to this. Um, uh, if if I walk into a room and there's a guy with blood on his hands and a woman in the corner bleeding, I'm gonna obviously believe that he hit her. Y you know. It, if I if I if I hear my daughter say, "Ow, 
don't hit me. And I walk in and my son's in there, um, you know, with like a, a stick and it's raised over his head in, you know, ready anticipation to hit my daughter. I'm going to assume that that's what happened. I'm going to say, hey, son, why did you why did you hit my daughter? See what I mean? And and, and then he's not going to say, no, I didn't do that. Uh, I mean, I guess he could. <laughs> he could. <laughs> Sometimes we lie about stupid stuff. But anyways, um, it's important that we don't accuse until there's sufficient attempt okay, to, to understand. Oh, the Gospels are filled with contradictions. Have we actually tried to understand it or have we just jumped to a conclusion? So the, the church throughout history has had these four accounts with differences. And they kept them as they were and decided not to correct them, not to spell, not, not, not spell, spell check, that's the wrong word, but not to, um, what is it called, fact check or whatever. They left them as they were. Um, there was actually a person who tried to, and I don't want to get too far into this, but who tried to take the four Gospels and make one cohesive story from, to, using the four Gospels as his source. And the church said, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. And I think that it's important to realize that. So, you know, what, what happens is we come to it and we see what we assume is a contradiction. We say something like this. Well, nobody has noticed a contradiction until me. Yeah, so after 2,000 years, um, nobody saw that, okay? Or did you think that maybe they didn't think that that was a contradiction? Maybe they thought that there was a perfectly reasonable answer. I mean, you can't walk in in the middle of a conversation and say, yeah, I know everything. And it's just a sure way to fail. Um, so there are some common apologists um, that I think will help in your studies. Um, and some of these are posted on the Young Adult page. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It's, it's a different group. Um, not all of my YouTube viewers will, 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 will know that. Um, so anyways, uh, some, some common apologists... For, contra uh, for contradictions, Norman Geisler, he actually died, but uh, he wrote that book, uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an, an Atheist. Um, then there's Bill Mounts. He was on the, I, I, I still don't remember what it was, and so I'm going to make the same joke I made uh, during Yams this week. He was on the Council of the Wizards uh, that for the ESV Bible, and also I believe he might still be for the NIV. Um not positive about that, but but I I believe he still is. Anyways, uh, he teaches Greek. He's got that um, that Greek grammar uh, learning biblical Greek uh, series called uh, the Basics of Biblical Grammar. Um, yeah, Biblical Greek, Biblical Greek. Ooh wee. Um, he just recently wrote a book last year called Why I Trust the Bible, uh, but it's spelled Why Should I Trust the Bible, but should is crossed out and the question mark is crossed out, so it says Why I Trust the Bible. Um, I haven't gotten around to reading that one yet. I, I own it. I am ready to read it. It's on the to be read. It just hasn't quite made it there, but still wanted to tell you about it. Another one is Mark Roberts. Uh, he was writing a series of blogs from what I remember, and uh, this publisher was like, hey, yeah, I turned that into a book. And so he wrote this book called Can We Trust the Gospels? Um, I have read that one. It's very good, very easy to understand. I highly encourage it. Um, there's another one by a guy that I oftentimes disagree with. His name's Ken Ham. Um, he's got this website, Answers in Genesis. Um, I, I don't, I, I definitely don't agree with him on everything that he says. However, um, Answers in Genesis is a very good source to have and to know about. Um, <clears throat> and it, if you can just get past your own ideas about the age of the earth and that kind of stuff, it's a lot easier to enjoy Ken Ham's stuff in other areas. And I'll just leave it with that. He kind of has this hyper-literalism thing that we'll probably talk about later, so it's not really important. Basically, it's the idea that everything in the Bible has to be taken as hyper-literal. And it's like, yeah, no, it doesn't, though. And, you know... Yeah. The, for instance, the Bible says about the trees, you know, clapping their hands. It, it doesn't really mean that the trees had hands that they clapped, right? I mean, come on. Not everything has to be understood hyper-literal. And in my opinion, Ken Ham opens himself up to a lot of um, arguments with people about the Bible because he does stuff like this. Oh, it has to be understood hyper-literal. Well, it, basically that leaves up a lot of room for contradictions, and I'll just leave it at that. 
Um, so, um, but Ken Ham himself has this website, Answers in Genesis. Contrary to the name, it is not just about Genesis. They actually go through things all throughout the Bible. Um, I actually believe that that's where I found out about Edward Thiel's work um, on the dating the um, Kings and Chronicles, which I'll talk about in a second, so don't worry, really worry about that. But anyways, he also has two books, which I own both of them, called Demolish Supposing Bible Contradictions. Um, I, I have not finished those two books, so I, I'm not positive about whether I agree with them, but like I said, that's not even the main issue. I'm just trying to give you um, places to go. Um, it's a lot easier to learn and grow if you don't go to it with the idea of I know everything and there's one right answer. It's easier if you just go to it and say, okay, I'm here to learn and some of the things that I think might not be true and be willing to have that place of growth. So some more biblical resources here. Um, Got Questions is a great website that answers common questions like, hey, what did Paul mean when he said so-and-so? or uh, um, <clears throat> stuff like that. Uh, another one is CARM. That is an apologetic uh, page. They, uh, is more of just the defense of the faith and, and theology and that kind of stuff. Uh, Defending Inerrancy is a website do devoted to uh, contradictions in the Bible um, and explaining them and whatnot. So I highly recommend that. Um, God and Science is a website that seeks to kind of narrow the the ravine or the, the gap between science and, and religion, specifically Christianity. So uh, it has some interesting thoughts there. Um, don't necessarily agree with everything, but just wanted to throw it out there. Um, Bible Archaeology, as the name obviously implies, this is a site that just talks about uh, archaeological research as it applies to the Bible. Um, Another pastor at the church that I am at currently uh, has a um, YouTube channel called Sheep Among Wolves where, as far as I understand, he mostly just deals with um, cults and the occult. Um, I'm not positive about that, but I know that a large majority of his videos um, are about that. I know that he does some um, devotional kind of things, uh, weekly or Wednesday wisdom, that kind of stuff. So uh, check it out. Um, another resource, resource that I, I personally use quite a lot is um, called Bible Hub, and there's another one, Bible Gateway. It it's, it's, makes it easier to compare translations and to read things in a different translation than maybe the translations that you own. And then, of course, my uh, YouTube channel is called Encouragement Vlog. So um, there's a lot of times when, when you're doing a translation for the, of the Bible where there's many things that it could be, many translations that it could be, and... So instead of just rushing to, oh, it's a contradiction, it, it's always better to just stop and think about it for a little bit. Um, for instance, you know, some of these translations that have multiple ways to be understood, the problem isn't the manuscripts, the problem isn't with the translator, the problem is the lack of historical details. We just don't know. So the person who's translating does the best that they can at the time um, and then sometimes they're proven wrong with later research. That doesn't mean that the Bible is wrong. That doesn't mean that, um, you know, the translator was deliberately misleading people. It just means we didn't know. And so they took a guess as to what they thought the translation what should be at the time. Um, a good example of this is when the census was, um, something that's oftentimes brought up. We'll probably talk about it um, in the coming weeks. And um, there's a few issues. Number one, um, there could have been multiple cens censuses, cens censuses. Anyways, um, they could there could have been multiple censuses <laughs> uh, taken, um, and so that wouldn't have been a contradiction or a uh, uh, that wouldn't have been a contradiction. That wouldn't have been a falsehood or a um, incorrect detail on the gospel's part. It would have just been something that the translators didn't know about. Um, another good ex uh, another good example would be. Um, Uh, or another thing I could be, I mean, um, about the census is there's there's multiple ways to translate that sentence, and so it does, it's not necessarily a, a, a contradiction. A contradiction has to be something where this is for sure the way this is translated. We have all the details, and it just turns out that it's wrong. So obviously you're going to have to calm down with ah contradiction because there's a lot of things, especially with ancient history, where you have to understand that your view could at any moment change and you have to be okay with with dealing with it with kind of walking through the process 
um, and that kind of stuff. And I think that a lot of people don't really understand that about history, and they think, oh, if it's in a history book, this detail will forever be true. Not necessarily. Um, so there, there's, contra there, there's, there's categories of contradictions, eight specific um, categories I'm going to talk about. The first one, not reading what the Bible actually says. There was a, n a number of years ago now, I remember when it first came out, but now it's been a number of years, um, when, the, when the headline for all these different newspapers were saying, the Bible is wrong, the Israelites didn't really kill all the Canaanites, but that's exactly what Judge, the book of Judges said, is that God told them to do this thing that they never actually did, they never actually completed it. So was the Bible wrong? No, the Bible was not wrong. God gave them a command that they did not do. That doesn't mean the Bible was wrong. That means that you, the, the person didn't understand that the book of Judges' main point was in pointing out Israel's failure to obey God fully. Um, number two, uh, the second category of contradiction, and I get these, eight, these list of eight things actually from a, from a uh, Pentecostal book called Bible Doctrines by, um, let me see, Menzies and Horton. So um, the these are I, I totally agree with them. I think that it's a great little list. Um, but they also cited it from someone else who oh don't even bother asking me because I have forgotten. Another the next category category is a, is a false interpretation. So basically things can, things don't translate as well in black and white as we would like. And then there's there's like I said multiple ways of understanding things, and some words have multiple meanings. So for instance. Um, it's very common nowadays for people to believe in a global flood, or religious people, to believe in a global flood, um, even though there's really no evidence to back up such a cataclysm. But the, the thing is, you have to understand that back then, people didn't think about the world in such global terms. They thought, as far as we can tell from research, they thought about it in more terms of, you know, the area. You know, not so much as a globe, global, but more as the land that was created. So, um, the word translated in a lot of Bibles as um, all the world was flooded um, is oftentimes translated as all the land. So, if you can keep up that same translation procedure and take it over to Genesis especially keeping in mind that all people lived in the same area, so it kind of would have been a bit of overkill to flood the entire world. Just pointing that out. Um, and then there's the issue of whether or not it should be translated as hyper-literal, literally all of the land, or, you know, the grand majority of people were flooded. There's arguments on both sides, but let's just stick at one argument at a time. Um, that that one thing where most uh, in the rest of the Bible it's usually translated as land, but here, and uh, when it's used, you know, which is over half of its uses, if I remember correctly, is in Genesis to talk about the global flood. It's like, well, that's obviously you know an error in uh, in our, in the interpretation and kind of a bias in the people interpreting. Um, you you can't say, okay, this is how we understand the world now. So that means that that's how they understood it then. And so I want to make this a bigger event than it needs to be. So that way I can, you know, more prove God. That's just, that's just nonsense. Um, the next idea or category would be a wrong idea of the Bible. So basically thinking that everything that the Bible records, it condones. Oh, well, well the Bible says that, uh, that uh, polygamy is okay. What? Well, yeah, it, 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 it mentions people having more than one wife. And it's like, well, hold on. It didn't say go ye and do likewise. <laughs> it, you know what I mean? So sometimes people just have a wrong idea of the Bible and they think it has a contradiction when it's not really a contradiction. Um, that's actually one of the things we'll probably talk about is how Jesus dealt with the law and whether he contradicts the law or, you know, how to kind of walk through that. So... The fourth category is that some accounts are condensations. They're, they're, they're limited. Um, a good example of this would be the different names in different genealogies. If you compare the genealogies, you'll see that most of them aren't the exact same. There's differences in them. Some names are in, some names are out, so on and so forth. Um, and some accounts are not exhaustive. There's this idea going on that Genesis has to record every single moment of the human life from creation on down to Abraham, and that's just not true. I mean, that's just that's just not true. We don't know if God was speaking to those people, if he was, you know, working in those people. We don't know anything about that time. The Genesis just has this way of very quickly skimming over it, and um, 
you know, it, it, it does this not just for history's sake alone, but it does it does this for theolo theological purposes. I actually um, taught a lesson where I was showing different uh, reasons why the gene genealogies of the um, book of Genesis are even there. And uh, most of them are things that are completely neglected. And uh, not that this is the time or the place to get into that. We'll probably do that some other time. But my point being, um, if you look at to it being an exhaustive list of history, you're going to be disappointed when you realize that some things are just condensation, some things are just limited. It, it really opens up the world of, ah, the problem is in my understanding, not actually with what's going on. So the fifth contradiction is the thing that I was talking about before with Edward Thiel's um, research, where it looks like there are a number of chronological issues from... Uh, I mean, in the books of Kings and Chronicles, so that just it's just a mess. And I would totally agree, it does look like a mess. But uh, research has actually shown that um, there was a reason for that mess. So there, there were different calendars that different people were using that um, counted the year that the king started differently. So maybe, um, let's say, um, Isaiah is king and he dies, and Nicole becomes king in his place, and uh, she serves the rest of that year and then the next year. Do you start counting the year that he actually took that, that Nicole took the place of Isaiah or do you count the next year? Well, different nations counted that differently. And that is reflected in the books of Kings and Chronicles. For instance, on one part it says, and I forget which king it says, but it says, this guy reigned seven years, and then it says, this guy reigned eight years. Well, which is it, seven or eight? Well, yes, it depends if you're counting that what's called a, a renal year. Um, and then another issue is that the different calendars started on different times of the year. So, I mean, that brings up even more issues. If you'd like to know more about this, you can read um, Edward Thiel's, um, oh, what is the name of that book? Um the Mysterious Numbers of Hebrew Kings. That's what it's called by Edward Thiel. Uh, really the only book that he's written, so it's not going to be that hard to find. Uh, definitely worth reading. There is one part that I disagree with him on um, concerning the dating of, uh, of a king, but I think that it's easily overcome, and it's not that big. So if I ever teach on that, we'll talk about it. But otherwise, let's move on. The sixth uh, category of contradictions, what's called a hyperliberalism. So this is... Uh, how Ken Ham writes his books like the whole Bible is meant to be understood this, this way, but it, it's not. There are some numbers in the Bible that are rounded, and that's okay. You know, oh, no, the Bible can't round any numbers. Everything has to be exact. Why? Who says that everything has to be exact? Well, if God really inspired it, then it had to be, had to be literal and – hold on. Who said that? That's like saying if God really inspired the Bible, he has to record in scientific detail um, exactly how the world was formed and exactly how all that stuff happened. It, why? Why would he have to do that to prove that he that he inspired it? That, that, just because something is important to you doesn't mean that God is held to that standard uh, to prove something. And um, so, yes, the Bible can't have rounded numbers. Um, another thing is, is failing to take into account the differences in genres. So, so like for a genre would, would be like um, this part is written in poetry, this part is written in history, and so on and so forth. Um, failing to understand the differences in genres or the author's intentions. For obvious reasons, if you look at the Bible, different books were written for different reasons. That, 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 that can't be a surprise to us. We have to realize, okay, yes... You know, not everybody writes for the same reasons. God might have inspired it, but he did definitely use people, and those people had different ideas um, about what they were trying to get across. And that's very true also for the Gospels. Um, the four Gospels do have, um, are written by four different people who were writing for very much so for different reasons. Um, Matthew kind of has a whole Jewish spin that he's doing. John's just trying to show uh, Jesus as Godhood. Uh, well, maybe that's not his only purpose, but you get what I'm saying. And uh, Luke is trying to give more of an orderly account, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, Mark, which some people have said uh, he's trying to be more Roman. Um, I'll leave that for later speculation. Um, so the next uh, category, seven of eight, um, ignorance of textual criticism. So basically, we don't have copies of any of the original books <laughs> – original copies. Let me say that differently. We don't have any original copies of any of the books of the Bible. What we have are um, our manuscripts, or copies. We have a, a bunch of these, and 
but that still leaves the leaves room for what's called textual criticism, where you take the different manuscripts and you try to find what was originally written. Now, the scholars believe that they have about a 97 to 99% accuracy rate, that they're 97 to 99% positive of exactly what was written. So, you know, don't don't get to bend out of shape. But there are some very big uh, areas that cause a lot of concern. One is the Book of Acts, which um, has basically these two two potential manuscripts and um, it just caused a lot of problems. Uh, if I remember correctly, one's called the Western Manuscript and it um, it's the one that has a lot of things and it's longer and it's just, it, there's just a lot of issues there. So uh, another issue would be John chapter like eight with the woman who's gonna get stoned and Jesus is drawing in the sand. Um, another one would be uh, at the end of the Gospel of Mark. So if you, t if you, if you count for all these textual um, uncertainties, I guess you could say, you'll find that there's no actual doctrine that has changed. It's it's not that big of a deal. It's not something where um, the whole Christian message hangs on this. It, it, no. Um, they're mostly sure of the transition, like I said, but variations still exist and, and possibilities still exist. So that, that, that would be just kind of an example of, of that. Um, and, uh, you know, things did change throughout time, and people copied wrong, they, they made notes, they made changes, that kind of stuff did exist. So, so you do have to take into account that. Um, for instance, when you're reading the King James Version, you're going to find a lot more uh, problems than you will in a newer translation, because the King James is, I mean, yeah, people read the King James and they think it's like God's gift to the world or something, but they don't really understand it, and then they include things which were probably later editions, um, whereas in newer translations, they'll say, yeah, this this was more than likely um, added in later because the oldest manuscripts don't even have this part. Stuff like that. Um, and, you know, obviously people who read the King James are, are more prone to say something like, um, this is the one translation and all the other translations are wrong and they all compromise the truth and so on and so forth. Um, the last category of contradiction that I want to bring, that I want to talk about is... Um, Sometimes ancient words have numerous uh, have numerous translations possible. Sometimes, sometimes it's not as black and white and easy as to understand as um, some people make it out to be. So when you have somebody who goes to the Bible with the idea of this is wrong, it's filled with contradictions. I don't have to understand it. It has to it has to just make sense to me, and it has to be according to my understanding. And then you go to a problem like this, where you have no understanding of how language works or how history works or anything like that. It's going to seem like a contradiction, and that's not a literal. That's not an actual contradiction. That's your failure to understand something. Um, and it's the same thing if, if I go to a math book and say, well, I think this is how math should work. And so then I go to the math problem and I say, well, this is wrong because it doesn't work how I think it should work. Well, that doesn't mean that the math is wrong. That means my, my understanding of the math is wrong. And uh, so, you know, there are different different areas when if something looks like a contradiction, you definitely need to go, go to it with a more discerning eye and say, okay, so is it a contradiction, though? Um it, if you have insufficient knowledge for a problem, that doesn't mean that it's a contradiction. It means that you do not fully understand. Okay, there's still more room for research as a way a way of saying that. And uh, so obviously, this might seem to a lot of people as you know just copying out. Um, oh, you just don't want to answer the hard questions. Well, no, not really. You have to be in research. You have to be. Um, it's like this: the theory of evolution, right? It comes out, uh, you know, when, when Charles Darwin and all that, but there's a lot of things with Charles Darwin's origi original hypothesis that's just wrong. I mean, just wrong. Even if the idea of evolution could be salvaged, those initial ideas are wrong. Uh, with poor, poor support and all these different things. But the theory has changed throughout time. Does, does that mean that adapting the theory to try and make it more accurate means that it didn't happen in any way, shape, or form just because we don't have full understanding of how it happened? Most atheists would say, no, of course not. You know, Charles Darwin, he, he, he started the, roll, the, the rock rolling, and, and just more research and more science has just kind of cleared the way. And that's exactly what I'm saying. Just because we tried to, under, tried to understand an ancient book and tried to translate and we made errors and we didn't quite understand everything, just because we didn't have complete understanding about something, that didn't make it a contradiction. Um, and 
I mean, obviously, if you can't see, you know, how atheists use that for evolution, but you you can see how Christians use it for the Bible translation, that's just, you, you might be biased. Um, so a contradiction must be two opposite and mutually exclusive things for it to actually be a contradiction. There's a lot of things that people say, contradiction, that, that's not a contradiction. Uh, so an example of this would be Jesus was a man and Jesus was a woman. Well, he can't be both. Either he was a man or he was a woman. You can't. He can't be both. Um, uh, another example is if the end of the Gospels, where Jesus has been resurrected, if it said this: one and only one person was at the tomb on Sunday morning, or only one group of three women were at the tomb at Sunday morning, and they all got there at the same time. And see what I mean? Okay, now now we're dealing with a contradiction. But that's not what the Bible says. Um, if I if there's three people standing there and I say. Greg walked up and said, well, it wasn't just Greg, was it? No, it was also Jerry and Todd. But my story doesn't really depend on Jerry and Todd being there. So I'm going to go ahead and just drop them out. And see what I mean? That doesn't mean that there's a contradiction in my story that, you know, I have lied. And no, I just left out an, an issue that didn't really matter. So does it matter? It does, it does it really matter that the Bible has contradictions? It, if the Bible has contradictions, sorry. Does it really matter if the Bible has contradiction? Isn't it just a matter of faith and, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Faith is, is just about faith. It doesn't really apply to the real world. Well, a lot of people treat it like that. But the, the, the truth is, is that it, it should matter, okay? And the reason why it, it matters is because you should give thought to what you believe and why you believe it. You shouldn't just believe things. You shouldn't just believe every every you know theory and every crazy wing bat that comes along. There there should be a process where you are believing things that are reasonable, and you should ensure that you believe something something worthwhile, something trustworthy. So yes, I, I think it absolutely does matter because if the Bible is is not accurately recording things, it's just a lie, and you can comfort yourself with a lie, but at the end of the day, it is still a lie. So you, you kind of have to come to the come to the to the conclusion of you know hey am I just believing something comfortable and I think this isn't just a religious thing people do this in all areas of life you know they'll do it with science and they'll do it with anything that gives them comfort uh, to support their bias all research so long as it just confirms the thing that I already believe it also matters because young and weak Christians can be persuaded from their faith very quickly and um, they, they oftentimes are for a lack of basic answers that could have been could have been answered. So then it does matter. If it's just for the sake of YouTube arguments, well, that doesn't really matter, like, at all. And there will always be those YouTube comments, I mean, honestly. <coughs> Excuse me. So, as I was saying, there will always be those YouTube, YouTube comments. Um, but some people believe that Christianity is not reasonable because the voice of the doubters is louder. And it's not true, it's just a common conception. So understanding things like contradictions and that kind of stuff, this is part of discipleship, it's part of growing. The early church practiced it, and um, you know it's an important part, but there, there comes a point when you have to know when to walk. You're not going to win every argument, and you shouldn't even try. And uh, you're not going to persuade every single person you, that you talk to. Jesus didn't, Paul didn't, you won't. <clears throat> and uh, so I'll continue this um, next next week and uh, you know I was I was in a YouTube uh, argument and uh, one guy was was complaining because I basically told him what I what I said in this lesson and he was saying that it basically wasn't fair because you know I was answering the supposed contradictions and giving the Bible a chance and I said yeah it's totally terrible when people don't just assume it's wrong and uh, you know, but but know what they're actually talking about. It's terrible when when people take it for what it claims to be. When people study and look for answers rather than just heaping you know these accusations on the Bible. It's, that's just a terrible thing. And, and the truth is, that a lot of people want to go to the argument with the odds in their favor. They don't want to go to it to learn or to, or to interact or to understand other people. They want to go to it to just kind of val uh, val verify what they already um, what they already chose to believe. And so what people do is that people join forces to have straw man arguments. They, they, they build up these arguments that aren't really what the person believes, but because it's so easy and fun to make fun of, they'll just do that. And then they'll all get to, in, together and talk about how stupid the Bible is when, when they don't even study the Bible. I just, I just find that so idiotic. 
And you really have to watch out because some people will try and look for an argument, have the wisdom not to take the bait. But then when they do, they'll, or if, when you do fail at this, they'll, they'll do something like this. They'll try to establish the baseline for an argument on the negative, where you have to gain ground. Okay, like this. Since we all know that the Bible is stupid, well, how about, is the Bible stupid? Since the Bible is unscientific, instead of, well, is the Bible unscientific? Or are people just using it improperly? Um, well, since we uh, since the Bible is wrong and, and, and filled with errors, well, is it wrong and filled with errors? Let's let's talk about this. And uh, you know, so just be aware of these kinds of things when people are trying to persuade you from your faith. That um, you know, that there's a lot of different. It's not it's not a black and white issue. And I guess you know that's really the best way to summarize that. Um, and we were talking about this in the lesson, and somebody brought up the, brought up the the point that Christianity is blinking is is is, tr is having blind faith is having to you know, and I understand you know they were saying that growing up in the church people kind of looked down on on asking questions because it was a sign that you didn't have enough faith or whatever, and that's just nonsense. I honestly think that sometimes apologetics and theology are necessary just to free Christians from people who pretend like they're Christians but are just, I don't know, demeaning the faith. Um, here's the thing. We have reason to believe what we do. Paul and Peter and, and, and other people in the, in the Bible, they talked about this, about the way they weren't just following cleverly devised myths. But, but these were things that they actually saw, they actually experienced. It wasn't just randomly, oh, let's just invent something. It wasn't like that. Um, you don't have to stand on, on blind faith. It, it, it's, it's equivalent to saying this, well, I believe that the earth is round and I'm standing on blind faith. But you don't have to stand on blind faith. There's good reason to believe that the earth is round. I mean, that, that's like a scientific fact. You don't, you don't have to stand on blind faith. And that's how it is with the Bible and Christianity too. A lot of times people just don't know and they just go around their ignorance and say, oh, well, I'm just standing on blind faith. And, uh, the, but there, there, there comes a point though where you have to say, okay, look, this this conversation is not going to go anywhere, and you have to know when to walk. I, I was actually there was another pastor in the area that um, posted something um, about divorce, and there was a person who commented back, and they were saying basically that um, he was misusing the Old Testament. And long story short, he was in, he was probably in a relationship with a uh, married woman, and he was trying to just you know b argue a point of something that he believed. See what I mean? And he obviously didn't think that he was trying to do this thing. Maybe he was considering. Maybe he's done it in the past. Maybe he knows somebody that's done it. I don't know. I, I don't know. But I'm, I'm totally just assuming there. But you can tell when somebody um, has a certain history with something because as soon as it's brought up, they have all kinds of all kinds of things that they want to talk about with it. Um, and it, what it comes down to isn't so much, oh well, you know, the Bible says it and I believe it. it it's more of, um, well, I want to believe this, so I'm going to say this. And uh, I, I, I didn't even enter the conversation because I, I realized, and I'm pretty sure that the other pastor did too because he really didn't carry on the argument. But um, the guy didn't understand how the law applies to us today. And so because he didn't understand that, when that pastor was trying to, was trying to post something about the law, um, this guy got all defensive about it. And it was something he wasn't going to listen to. I mean, I would have had to say, okay, look, th this is how the law applies to us today. This is how that passage applies to that. And this is how it applies to our life. And that means that you are, in fact, wrong. But would it have gone anywhere? Would you have listened now? See what I mean? Th there, there comes a point when you have to say, okay, this, 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 this there's nothing I can say in the, in this situation. And, and you do definitely ha have to kind of have that wisdom and... Um, you know, don't you, you don't have to go to every single fight that you're invited to. Every single time there's an argument or somebody's, you know, disgruntled or whatever, you don't have to be a part of it. You can just walk away. So uh, we'll continue this next week, um, talking about Bible contradictions, not for the point of arguing, <laughs> for the for the for the point of learning. And uh, okay.